Tonight on Brian Ross Investigates. Get your hands in the air! You're all under arrest. In the movies, Kevin Costner is often the lawman. I have sworn to put this man away with any and all legal means at my disposal, and I will do so. But now an explosive new lawsuit claims Costner in real life broke the law with a secret Swiss bank account, something he denies. But the accusation comes from a former Swiss banker who became America's most rewarded whistleblower, Bradley Birkenfeld. Just because you're not indicted doesn't mean you didn't break the law. He'll join us along with his lawyer to tell us what he knows. Plus a follow-up on our exclusive reporting on the sex abuse scandal in USA Swimming. I cry a lot. I lost my innocence. Now a one-time U.S. Swimming Olympic star is coming forward with inside information on how the sport covered up for guilty coaches. Uh, I did what I could, and in retrospect, I wish I had been stronger. I wish I had been tougher. And our shout-out for the person at the New York Times who stood up to the threats from President Trump. The New York Times is totally dishonest, totally dishonest. Yeah, I've had a platform to stand up for journalism, and I'm proud to do that. From the Law and Crime Network studios in New York City's Herald Square, this is Brian Ross Investigates. Good evening and welcome. Tonight, America's most rewarded whistleblower strikes again. Former Swiss banker Bradley Birkenfeld was paid more than $100 million by the U.S. government for blowing the whistle on Americans who had secret bank accounts in his Swiss bank, UBS. Now, in a new lawsuit, he names two more high-profile Americans he says also had secret accounts, but were never identified publicly. It's an allegation they strenuously deny. Get your hands in the air! You're all under arrest! In the movies, Kevin Costner is often cast as a man of the law, a man of integrity. I have sworn to put this man away with any and all legal means at my disposal, and I will do so. As Elliot Ness in The Untouchables, as the Wild West Marshal, Wyatt Earp. But in this new lawsuit, whistleblower Bradley Birkenfeld claims Kevin Costner and billionaire businessman Leonard Lauder, the chairman emeritus of Estee Lauder Cosmetics, had secret accounts at the UBS Bank in Switzerland. In the lawsuit, Birkenfeld names the bankers, he says, handled the accounts of Costner and Lauder. And, he says, he provided both names, among many others, to U.S. authorities at the IRS and the Department of Justice. But Birkenfeld claims that when he went to publish his book, Lucifer's Banker, both Costner and Lauder denied to the publisher that they had the accounts and threatened legal action against the publisher. As a result, Birkenfeld claims in the lawsuit, the names of the two men were deleted from the book, and thousands of already printed books had to be destroyed. And joining us now from Washington is Brad Birkenfeld, the whistleblower. Mr. Birkenfeld, thank you very much for being here. As you know, both Kevin Costner and Leonard Lauder strongly deny the claims you make in your lawsuit. Are you certain of your facts? The attorneys filed this lawsuit uh, on the facts that I gave to the Department of Justice, the Internal Revenue Service, and the Securities and Exchange Commission, along with the U.S. Permanent Subcommittee on Investigations. So when people read my complaint, it speaks for itself. And I've tried to uh, whistleblow on this issue for over a decade now, and uh, this lawsuit comes up with the facts that were presented in the lawsuit. When you first made these allegations before you went off to prison, you were convicted uh, by the uh, federal government even after you provided all that information. Uh, you told me the same thing, and I, at the time, talked to Kevin Costner. He could not have been stronger in his denials. He says there's no laws, there's no account at UBS, no account overseas at all. It's just not true. It's a strong denial. Well, I, I don't expect him to admit uh, my allegation. Uh, we're going to have to get into a court of law to uh, get to the truth. Uh, that's what courts do. So I think it's important for people to understand that I worked at UBS during that time, and I worked with uh, the gentleman who took care of his account, and he knows this uh, for a fact, Stefan Forer, who was my colleague at UBS in Geneva. So I didn't just make this up. I, I told the truth to all of these government agencies and if there was a problem with that, they would have indicted me for lying, which I did not lie. To the contrary, I told the truth. Is there any documentary proof? Can you tell us how much was in the account, how active it was? Well, I think we'll leave that to the court trial and see uh, what happens with that. I don't think I want to prejudice the court, uh, the court filing. Uh, certainly, my attorney can uh, elaborate more on that. But we're, uh, we're looking forward to getting to the truth, as we've always said. 
and I've said this from the beginning as a whistleblower that exposed the largest and longest running tax fraud in the world. We have a question now from the control room from executive producer Rhonda Schwartz. Help me, Rhonda, what's a good question for Mr. Birkenfeld? Bradley, you have uh, already received $104 million. You've published a book. Why are you bringing this up now? Why, after all this time, are you coming back to this and bringing this up again? Well, Rhonda, that's a fantastic question. And I think people who know me understand that as a courageous whistleblower that exposed, as I said, the largest tax fraud in the world at UBS in Switzerland, now I have to expose my own government, the corrupt Department of Justice, who failed to do their job, but furthermore, covered it up. So the very fact that they're supposed to enforce the law, but they end up breaking the law, shows that Americans are fed up with this kind of nonsense in, in government. That's why I'm here in Washington, actually, to expose more fraud by the corrupt Department of Justice. Mr. Birkenfeld, you said you gave all this information to the Department of Justice, the IRS, the Securities Exchange Commission. There's no record of them taking any action against either Kevin Costner or against Leonard Lauder, who, by the way, says, yes, there were accounts, but they were fully disclosed to the government. Well, I, I can't speak for the incompetence of the Department of Justice. I mean, uh, there were 19,000 accounts at UBS. And how many indictments have we seen? So how long does it take to indict people when you had it on a silver platter over a decade ago from the whistleblower who worked there? So everyone has said that I... I told the truth. I gave them accurate information. It was timely and supportive to this whole cause. They were fined $780 million. They closed the business down. And then, of course, they had to give up 4,700 names, which really wasn't all of them. So you begin to ask yourself, why didn't they find them properly? Why didn't they get all 19,000 names? Why haven't they indicted these people? Because they're part of the problem, not part of the solution at the Department of Justice. Mr. Birkenfeld, you have said to me before, you are seeking a pardon from the president who overnight gave pardons to two uh, billionaires uh, who he knows. Uh, what's the progress for you on that? Well, I don't know at this time. I think uh, once uh, the president, he hears of my uh, case and the merits of my case about bringing more than $20 billion back to America and from Swiss banks to American banks, closing down an illegal business and making sure that... Uh, a right is turned uh, upside down now because what has happened here is they've uh, they've accused me, the only banker, and put me in jail out of all the bankers that I exposed. So why should I be paying the price as the whistleblower who exposed this? And the Department of Justice admits that they could never have uncovered this without me. So it makes no sense whatsoever. Well, Bradley Birkenfeld, thank you so much for being here. You're going to continue presenting this lawsuit. You're sticking by your guns very quickly. I stick by the lawsuit. My attorneys have filed it. We've presented the facts to my lawyers. They vetted it. And clearly, uh, I feel as though the lawsuit speaks for itself, and we continue to uh, push that lawsuit in federal court in Miami. Bradley Birkenfeld, $104 million whistleblower. Congratulations on that. We'll talk to you soon. Up next, so an important update to our exclusive report on the sex abuse scandal at USA Swimming. Now an update on our report here last week about the sex abuse scandal at USA Swimming. A former Olympic gold medal swimmer and one-time insider at USA Swimming is coming forward in reaction to our report, which detailed a dark side to this sport, a long, sordid history of swimming coaches sexually abusing hundreds of young swimmers. I feel guilty all the time. She was 14 when her swimming coach began to sexually abuse her. And it physically and mentally hurts not to cry. Her coach was 43 years old at the time. Nathan Weddle, described on the website of the local swim club he owned as someone who loves the sport of swimming and the dedication it develops in young people. He turned me into somebody that no one around me could recognize. He groomed me into somebody that I'm not. Weddle ultimately confessed to what he had done. As kids, I mean, there was some touching of the breasts and things like that. About four or six. 
Yes. So whose car? Oh, mine, not hers. For the officials who run USA Swimming, it was yet another threat to their well-cultivated public image. A multi-million dollar operation funded by large corporate sponsors. It oversees some 3,000 swim teams around the country, the pipeline for future U.S. Olympic swim teams. It's all about you know, keeping Mercedes-Benz and their corporate sponsors and NBC happy and, 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 and protecting this image of Michael Phelps and Katie Ledecky. They prioritized you know, protecting the brand, winning a lot of medals, and not protecting the athletes Representing the United States of America, Michael Phillips. But for all the heroes and Olympic glory of USA Swimming, officials have known for more than a decade about a very dark side, hundreds of young swimmers who were sexually abused by their coaches. Cases including one of the country's top swim coaches, Sean Hutchinson, who was banned last year after Olympic medalist Ariana Kukar went public with allegations he had abused her. Organizations like USA Swimming have long been in a position to deter, detect, and discipline sexual abuse, and have done little or nothing to do such in an effort to protect their public image. By doing nothing, it enabled Sean Hutchison to abuse me for a decade. In fact, the USA Swimming website includes a list of almost 200 coaches who have been suspended or banned from the sport because of allegations or convictions for sexual abuse. The list now includes Nathan Weddle of North Carolina. The president and CEO of USA Swimming, Tim Hinchy, declined repeated requests to talk with us. And when we showed up at USA Swimming's annual gala fundraiser in New York, he would not tell us why. Only a tiny percentage of the group's 3,000 swim teams have been certified as so-called safe sports clubs. Sir, sir, how many recognized safe sport clubs exist today? Can you answer that question, sir? Mr. Hinchy, really. And we're joined now by David Burkhoff, the winner of four Olympic medals as a USA swimmer, two of them gold, and for years someone on the inside of the USA swimming governing body. He's now a lawyer in Missoula, Montana, and joins us from there. Thank you, Mr. Burkhoff, for being here. None of this surprises you at all, does it? No, it doesn't. And what's been going on that this has been covered up and is only now really still coming out? You know, I, I, I've been thinking about that over a, a number of years, and I, 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 it's hard to explain. I don't know if this is a, um, an issue unique to swimming or to amateur sports, but I think it's uh, partially to blame um, to our, our culture, which... Uh, avoids conflict, avoids uh, facing hard problems and hard issues in any constructive way. And unfortunately, in this case, uh, with abuse victims in my sport that I love so much, swimming, uh, we've had lots and lots of kids who suffered the consequences of um, our leaders not leading the way they should. You've told me over the years you tried to do something and nobody would listen. Is that accurate? I'd say uh, the majority of people who were in positions of power uh, back in the early 90s when I was still an athlete, and uh, I, I preface this by saying that in the early 90s, late 80s, the athletes had little to no power. Um, the athletes have a lot more uh, uh, say in what happens in USA Swimming and other amateur sports now that they've been professionalized. But um, back in the, in the 90s, uh, when I uh, suggested that we uh, enact um, a code of conduct and a process for removing uh, bad coaches from our ranks, um, it was basically mothballed and, and um, nothing happened. And yet this abuse, this sexual abuse of young swimmers, mostly females, going on and sort of known. You would hear scuttlebutt. And um, what really prompted me to do what I did back in 1992 uh, was a reaction to hearing uh, from some of the U.S. Uh, the U.S. team members and Texas swimmers about the alleged abuse of, of uh, Kelly uh, Davies. And never met Kelly. I didn't know his coach or her coach. 
Um, but I heard these rumors and they were, uh, to me, extremely offensive. And um, I didn't think that coaches who were um, predispositioned to abuse athletes should be in the sport, period. And yet, and yet that coach stayed in swimming for a long time. Yeah, he did. And um, I was uh, at the, uh, I think, 2008 Olympic trials watching with my family, and I saw Rick Curl walk one of the Olympic team members down the pool deck, and I said, what the hell is he doing? And as you know, Kelly Davis and her lawyer have in part blamed you that you should have done more. What do you say to that? You know, I, I think it's easy for uh, uh, Ms. Davies and her lawyer to blame me. Um, uh, but you got to remember when I was 25 years old, I was still an athlete. Um, and I was up against uh, 60, 70 year old men who were in control of uh, an organization and didn't really want to hear from this young whippersnapper, um, who, who was giving them, uh, you know, chicken little, uh, theories of what's going to happen to the organization. Uh, I did what I could. And in retrospect, I wish I had been stronger. I wish I had been tougher. Um, and uh, I wish I could have helped, uh, but as a young person who had no money um, and was in graduate school and uh, really didn't feel like he was being listened to, there's only, only so much I can do. Does that um, haunt you to this day? I don't know if it haunts me, um, because there were many, many other people who had firsthand knowledge, including her former coaches and her best friends, and in fact, her parents, uh, who knew about the abuse and didn't do, didn't do as much as they could have, uh, having that firsthand knowledge. Um, again, I, I've never met Kelly. I've never met, I, I've never uh, even spoken to Rick Curl. And yet I tried to do something. Um, you know, we can look at things in, in hindsight with 2020 vision and say, boy, I wish I was a, a stronger human and really fought for this. But at the time, uh, it, it was an uphill battle and um, I was running out of energy. And as you know, now there have been almost 200 coaches banned for life or at least uh, suspended. Uh, that's a terrible record. This problem has not ended, has it? I, I think there's a double answer to that. I think, yes, you're right. Uh, 200 people on the banned list uh, shows that there is a clear problem. Um, and the fact that many of those, if not a majority of those people added to the ban list were added after 2010, when we enacted our first safe sport rules, uh, what that tells me is that, um, we need to do more and we can't apply the brakes now as an organization, as a sport, we need to be vigilant and we need to do whatever it takes to, uh, keep kids from being, um, abused by coaches or officials or, uh, you know, even um, fellow swimmers. Well, David Burkhoff, thank you so much for joining us tonight. When we come back, our shout out to the point person at the New York Times who doesn't get a byline, hasn't won a Pulitzer Prize, but actually invited Donald Trump's lawyer to sue the paper and get a lesson in how the First Amendment works. We welcome the opportunity to have a court set him straight. Shout out tonight for someone who is not a journalist, but has helped set a tone of erudite resistance in an era when attacks on journalists have come from many directions, but none more ugly than from the White House. This is someone who works at what the president calls the failing New York Times. My name is David McCroft. I am the deputy general counsel at the New York Times Company, and my primary responsibility is anything that comes out of the newsroom that presents a legal problem. David McCraw has never won a Pulitzer Prize or even had a New York Times byline. But I told him that in newsrooms around the country, he is seen as a hero in an era of journalism under attack. I'm not sure I'm going to buy into the hero label, but certainly I've had a platform to stand up for journalism, and I'm proud to do that. It has put him head to head with Donald Trump. To. The New York Times is totally dishonest, totally dishonest. I think the main thing that concerns me has been the attempt by the president and others to delegitimize the press. It really is an invitation to distrust, to not believe. 
You are fake news. You are the enemy of the people. You look at the networks, you look at the news, you look at the newscasts, I call it fake news. I draw a line between that and criticism of the press. The press should be criticized, any institution should. But this idea of just to dismiss it as fake news, enemy of the people, I think has been deadly. Do you think Donald Trump believes that? I think he knows that it plays well to a political base. I don't know whether he really thinks that is a true fact. And the New York Times is failing. If I weren't here, <laughs> I believe the New York Times probably wouldn't even exist. When he continues to refer to the Times as the failing New York Times, what's the reaction inside this building? It's, it's a little amusing because, as you know, he also talks about how he saved the New York Times because subscriptions went through the roof when he was elected, and that's really closer to the truth. In his new book, Truth in Our Times, McCraw recalls perhaps his finest hour as he came to the defense of a New York Times report about two women who claimed Trump had physically groped them. He was like an octopus. It was like he had six arms. He was all over the place. Trump, then a candidate, angrily denied the allegation. Now we address the slander and libels that was just last night thrown at me by the Clinton machine and the New York Times and other media outlets as part of a concerted, coordinated, and vicious attack. And overnight, Trump's lawyer demanded the Times retract its story and issue an apology, saying, quote, failure to do so will leave my client with no option but to pursue all available actions and remedies. I felt that we needed to have a strong response. The response was this letter from McCraw, no retraction, essentially, see you in court. We did what the law allows. We published newsworthy information about a subject of deep public concern. If Mr. Trump disagrees, if he believes that American citizens had no right to hear what these women had to say, and the law of this country forces us and those who would dare to criticize him to stand silent or be punished, we welcome the opportunity to have a court set him straight. The letter went viral. In the end, I think the people at the Times were very happy <laughs> that I'd done it this way. Um, and I'm fortunate to work in a company that was going to stand behind me for a response this strong. So our shout out tonight for David McCraw, defender of the First Amendment. That's our program for tonight. Thanks for joining us. We'll see you back here next week. Good night.